everyone. This is lecture number three in a series on scholarly writing. The title of our series has been Face Your Journey with Competent Writing Skills by Dr. Roxanne M. Williams. We're going to spend just a little bit of time reviewing what we had talked about in the previous sessions. And if you're a listener today and you had never uh, listened to the first two sessions, I would encourage you to do so because one session does build upon the next. And our goal for these sessions um, are basically to make sure that uh, you have the background information that you need to have in order to be successful as a competent writer. And I believe that competent writing skills are demonstrated when your writing is focused, accurate, cohesive, and excellent. And so we began our discussion at session one talking about really expository writing. And the reason why we're talking about that first is because I believe that if a student has expository writing skills, that it very much just lends itself then to scholarly writing. We've talked about focused writing, meaning that every sentence in a paragraph has a purpose. Um, accurate writing basically is that you understand that in an expository paragraph or a scholarly paragraph, that your information is accurate if you're telling facts. And in scholarly writing, that's extremely important because you need to show evidence from scholarly resources. We've also talked about the importance of cohesion, uh, one sentence building upon the next sentence. We've talked about a way to begin thinking about a topic is to create a word map or an outline. And if you do that first, then from that word map, you can design your main idea sentence, which we liked to call a power one sentence if we're thinking about power writing skills. And then underneath your main idea sentence that you write main support sentences, which we call power two sentences. And then underneath the main support sentences, we wrote detailed support sentences, which are the power three sentences. So real briefly, uh, we'll review what a word map looks like. If we were writing about the main idea of time management, we might write support ideas on our word map that were checklists and calendars. And the reason we wrote those ideas was because we were trying to think of a relationship between our main idea and ideas that we would write about later on in our paragraph. We're always thinking about what are the relationships between our ideas. The relationship here, I think, is strategies. We're thinking about time management strategies. And we certainly could have thought of a different relationship where we could have thought about obstacles. We could have written about time management and thought about obstacles to good time management and then listed two ideas that would demonstrate uh, things that we felt caused problems for doctoral students with their time management. But we didn't choose obstacles. We chose strategies. So the relationship word between our ideas is so important. And I think a lot of times students don't get that part. They just think about their main idea for the paragraph, but they don't fine tune it to what about that main idea are they going to focus upon in that particular paragraph. So after you have the word map, then of course you write the main idea sentence. So if we're thinking about power writing, um, I would we'll call the main idea sentence a power one sentence. And I usually write that in red for the purposes of instruction because that helps everybody uh, visually see uh, the different purposes for the sentences. And of course, in a main idea sentence, you need to have uh, the main word or phrase. And in our example, that would be time management. You also need to have a relationship word in your main idea sentence. And in this case, it would be strategies. 
And then you also need to make sure that all the words in that main idea sentence truthfully are going to be reflected in the rest of your paragraph. You don't want to have a lot of extra fluff words or phrases that aren't going to be connected to the ideas that you're going to be showing in the rest of your paragraph. So the main support sentences, of course, are written underneath the main idea sentence, and we wrote them um, in kind of an orange color on our PowerPoint. These are the power two sentences. The main support sentences are really taken from that word map. So we had uh, the idea of checklists, and we make that into one of our power two sentences. And then from our word map, we also had the idea of calendars. And so we made that into another main support sentence or a power two. Real important that in the main support sentences, you're always naming something. You're naming some specific idea. And you don't have to, but sometimes helpful if in that power two sentence, you actually name or, or excuse me, you uh, repeat your main idea. So you repeat that power one concept in your power two sentence. You don't have to. In fact, if you do it too much, it might be too redundant and repetitive. But sometimes I think it is a good idea to repeat that main idea in your main support sentences to help you as a writer stay focused and helps the reader stay focused too, especially if the ideas are pretty complex. Underneath your main support sentences, then you write detailed support sentences. We call those power three sentences. And the detailed support sentences, of course, give specific examples or extensions of the ideas that you wrote about in the power two sentence. Often they answer the questions why or how. Real important that these detailed support sentences um, are focused and accurate and demonstrate cohesion. Remember the silly idea I gave you last time? We talked about denture commercials on television and how like maybe polygrip might be advertised. And in commercial, you kind of visualize or maybe even saw somebody biting into an apple. And the reason they could bite into the apple and not have their dentures fall out of their head was because they had this, this kind of gluey substance between their gum and between their dentures. And that's what these detailed support sentences do. They really tightly connect to the sentences that are right above them. So, of course, this kind of helps us again think about this acronym. We're focused, we're accurate, and we're cohesive um, in all of our sentences in our well-structured paragraph. So here's the example paragraph that we used last week. It's not a perfect paragraph, and I'm sure that everyone who reads it could find things that I could do to improve it. But I think it is a basic paragraph that really demonstrates uh, the different types of sentences in a well-structured expository paragraph. I'm just going to read it quickly to you. Doctoral students' time management strategies may determine their ability to succeed. Students consistently using prioritized checklists may find extra time to take University of Phoenix grammar tutorials. Once a week or day, list big chunk time tasks and small chunk time tasks aligned with personal learning goals, such as learning subject-verb agreement. Using varying calendars may cause students to meet assignment deadlines. Setting timers on iPhones, using Google Calendar reminders, or writing in a pocket calendar may help students submit paperwork on time to avoid point deductions and late penalties. I'd like to point something out to you here real quickly that I haven't mentioned before. And that on those orange sentences, when I'm teaching third graders, on the orange sentences, I would have them use transition words. They would say words like first, second, next, also, additionally. And sometimes there's a little bit of debate in scholarly circles whether you should use transition words like that or not. Sometimes using those transition words um, 
to help the reader realize that these are the main supports for your main idea. Sometimes that can be helpful. I definitely do use them sometimes. But of course, if you overly use those transition words like that, sometimes that can become intrusive and it detract, kind of distracts from the meaning of the rest of the paragraph. I thought I would just mention that to you because sometimes using those transition words in front of those power to sentences actually does help the reader, especially if the concepts are getting real complex. All right, so now we're finally ready for our new material. That was just a review. The end of your paragraph should have an ending sentence. And I chose a picture there of a present being wrapped and there's some string there. And an ending sentence is kind of like putting a bow or a ribbon on the, the package that you've just uh, put together. So this paragraph that you've just put together really needs an ending sentence. Very often, I see students not using an ending sentence at an end of a paragraph. What that ending sentence does is it ties together all the ideas of that paragraph and it kind of brings closure to it. It's really important when there's multiple uh, paragraphs in a paper uh, because I, I just feel like to let things flow from one paragraph to the next, there needs to be some kind of closure uh, that comes to one concept before you move to the next. Of course, you use a lot of different sentence styles in order to bring about that closure in that ending sentence. So let's talk a little bit about ending sentences. I believe that that ending sentence should contain your topic word or phrase. So in that example of what we were just talking about with time management, I would use the word or phrase time management in the ending sentence. Because after all, that's what the whole paragraph was about. There's different styles of sentences that you could use for your ending sentence. What you might do is you might list your main support concepts in that ending sentence. For example, uh, you know, you would say something about calendars and checklists. You could actually list all the main support ideas that you had. I wouldn't suggest that you did that in every ending sentence. If you overuse a certain style of sentence in, in your large pieces of writing like a dissertation, you know, it loses its effectiveness after a while. But I'm just telling you that this is one option for an ending sentence to list your main support ideas. Sometimes your ending sentence will actually look very similar to your main idea sentence, and there's nothing wrong with that. A really fabulous ending sentence, though, will not only tie together the paragraph that you just wrote, it will really link well to the next paragraph that you are writing. Okay, so here is the paragraph that we have been talking about. I'm not going to reread that whole paragraph out loud, but I am going to read to you the ending sentence that I did create. So the blue sentence at the end is what I'm reading. Students that master time management strategies may find that some of the other doctoral challenges are less daunting. So you'll notice that I did repeat here, um, I did repeat time management uh, because that was um, the main, the main um, idea of the paragraph. Um, I also did actually choose to re, uh, repeat the relationship word strategies. And, you know, I wouldn't have to do that, but I chose to. You'll notice that I talked about um, other doctoral challenges. So what my brain is thinking here is that my next paragraph is going to talk about something else that doctoral students need to deal with besides time management, some other issue of concern that I know that they have. So 
I'm pretty happy with myself that this ending sentence not only tied together this paragraph well, it led the reader to realize, oh, now she's going to talk about some other challenges. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but it really does help the reader know what to expect. And I think that sometimes is pretty helpful. All right, so we've talked a lot about focus and accuracy and cohesion. <laughs> but now I really want to talk about that E, that excellence. Part of excellence, I believe, in writing scholarly paragraphs as well as expository paragraphs is that you do have that ending sentence that not only ties the paragraph together but links to the next paragraph. Also, I believe that part of excellence is that you have something called coherence. Now, coherence isn't really the same thing as cohesion. Remember, cohesion is one sentence to the next, tightly connected. Coherence is kind of the same idea. It's but more of the idea, though, of the whole document flowing together, where one paragraph flows into the next, and then that next paragraph flow, flows into the next one. So I really believe that if you are an excellent scholarly writer, you have coherence. You, you see the big picture of your whole document. You're not just focused on one sentence or one paragraph, which of course you do need to do that, but you also always have in mind what the big picture is and the big connectedness <laughs> between all of the paragraphs and what it is you're really trying to say to your reader. And then another part of excellence is voice. So we're going to spend just a few moments talking about word choice, not only in your ending sentence, but really word choice in all of your sentences. I'd like to talk to you about the use of synonyms. So synonyms sometimes are really good way to make your writing a little bit more interesting. So like when I taught third grade, if we were writing a paragraph about dogs, for example, you know, I would talk to the kids about, okay, I see the word dogs, 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 dogs in every single sentence. It's kind of the same way with doctoral students. You know, they may kill um, that main idea word by repeating it too much. And so, for example, with my third graders, I'd say, okay, so in place of dogs, let's say canines. It's the same thing, but at least it's a little more interesting to listen to. Or we might call the dog, instead of saying the word dog, say man's best friend or something like that. Or maybe even use a specific name of a dog, um, Rover or, you know, Dachshund or whatever. Okay, but I do have some cautions listed on the right-hand side of the screen when we're talking about word choice. So the caution I want to give you about synonyms is, is that when you're writing, like, especially at a scholarly level, there's certain terminology that you're going to use that you don't want to use synonyms for. So let's say you're writing a dissertation about emotional intelligence, and, you know, this is, like, a really important word for your whole dissertation. You're not going to use a synonym for the word emotional intelligence because this is the coined word that the theorists have used and that the empirical researchers have used in, in their literature. And you don't want to confuse your reader by all of a sudden giving it a different name. In fact, when I did my dissertation on mentoring, you know, I really had to think about this. Do I want to keep calling it mentoring, 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 you know, through the whole paper, or do I want to call it peer coaching, or or should I not do that because I'm going to confuse the reader? So you have to be careful when you use synonyms when it's specific uh, terminology um, that really is associated with the literature. Okay, so another consideration is action verbs. You know, in expository writing especially, um, I always encouraged 
my writers to get away from using state of being verbs all the time. Is, am, are, was, were. There's nothing wrong with those verbs, but if you use them all the time, it doesn't create a whole lot of interest. So we try to use action verbs. Um, so, you know, instead of saying uh, maybe uh, these action verbs were blah, 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 we might say action verbs enhanced the writing. So enhanced is a much more interesting verb than saying a state of being verb like is, are, was, were. Okay, so now the caution side of the screen is, though, sometimes I see students getting real creative in their scholarly writing, and they use action verbs where they shouldn't. And all of a sudden, they use action verbs for inanimate objects. And we call this anthropomorphism. It's a big fancy word, but this is what happens. I gave an example there. Uh, a student might say something like, organizations demonstrated. Well, an organization can't demonstrate anything, but people can. So it's really important that think about what the verb is and who is doing the action of that verb. So you want to make sure that you're not giving inanimate objects, you know, that they're doing these actions because that's just not scholarly. Actually, that might be cute uh, in a Disney film, uh, <laughs> but in scholarly work, it's, it's just not acceptable. Okay, another consideration for word choice is impactful words. You know, uh, using adjectives and maybe using better word choice. If you notice that you keep on repeating certain types of words throughout your whole document, I notice some students do that. And there's nothing wrong with that to a certain degree, but sometimes, um, you know, it's like, can't we just use a different verb once in a while? <laughs> Let's mix this, mix this up a little bit. Um, but what I want to caution you about on the right-hand side of the screen with using impactful words is we can't use slang or biased wording in scholarly writing. So uh, we see students do this sometimes. Um, you know, you say something has strong meaning or, you know, something has high influence or something. Well, we really base everything on evidence. In scholarly writing we don't base it on your opinion so you have to be careful that these impactful words um, aren't kind of going over the line <laughs> and, and going from you know scholarly writing back down to the other end of the spectrum where all of a sudden we're into casual tone that we might use for a different genre or writing or maybe even when we're texting a friend and then another word choice consideration, not only in ending sentences, but all your sentences, uh, should be that you should think about fluff words. Um, you know, obviously there's really no place for fluff words at all. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't consider them at all, but maybe you need to consider them as far as editing, when you're editing your work. Um, you know, look to see, do I have some unnecessary words in my writing? And then, of course, the caution is to know what to eliminate and what not to eliminate. So I'm just going to give you a simple example. It's, it's not the best example, but what I see students doing a lot is adding a lot of extra prepositional phrases uh, that really could be eliminated. So if you would look at the second bulleted item on the screen, the records of criminals were read at the congressional hearing on February 5th. Well, there's nothing wrong with that sentence necessarily, but we could really get rid of the words of and on. So look at the last bulleted sentence, the same sentence with the same meaning, but I got rid of of and on. The criminal records were read at the February 5th congressional hearing. So all I did was reposition some of the words so I had the same meaning, 
but I got rid of some extra words I didn't need. I see often students writing these really long sentences that have like maybe three prepositional phrases in them, of this, on that, within this, between that, you know, it just goes on and on and on, and I'm just thinking, well, maybe you could divide this up into two different or three different sentences, or maybe you could just reposition some of the words and take out some of the fluff words and you wouldn't need you know this long string of prepositional phrases in your sentence all right i <laughs> so i've given you a few little hints about scholarly writing but now we're really going to more in depth go into scholarly writing and i'm sure that there's some people who have been listening to some of these sessions that are finally thinking, oh, she finally got to what I wanted her to get to. Um, all that other is things I already knew. Well, good, I'm glad you do know how to write an expository paragraph. But now we're going to really hone in on scholarly writing and uh, what makes uh, it really excellent. <laughs> of course, scholarly writing shows a higher degree of rigor. Um, than, than expository writing. But I also have some bulleted items here uh, that kind of help you understand some things that shouldn't be in scholarly writing. There really shouldn't be any informal language. The other day when I was scoring a paper, I noticed a student wrote the phrase, cannot be taught overnight. Um, the, the student actually had really good grammar, great you know writing conventions. But in my mind, immediately I thought, that is not what a scholarly writer would write. So some of those phrases that we just use in our American culture or, you know, whatever culture that you come from, little phrases that people use um, to use analogies, uh, a lot of times those little phrases are just not appropriate. Uh, they're just too informal. The second bulleted item, oh, I see this a lot. Students begin sentences with pronouns. Do not begin sentences with pronouns. You need to uh, begin your sentences very clearly and crisply and specifically. Instead of saying this issue, tell us what the issue is. Even if you talked about it in the previous sentence, uh, was uh, the, the issue that there's personality differences between employees, so then say it. Personality differences between employees, blah, 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 blah. But don't say this issue. Um, I know that sometimes it might seem redundant to you to um, repeat maybe that specific noun that you had used in the previous sentence, but this is all part of scholarly writing. Another real common one I see is students begin with that there is or there are. Okay, there is considered a pronoun. Don't begin sentences that way. Real often I see students begin with it. It is a pronoun. It is, you know, no. Instead of say it, say what it is. <laughs> uh, tell us what you're talking about. Uh, third bulleted item there, don't use personal pronouns. Now, this is kind of a scholarly debate amongst, you know, professors. But for the most part, I think you would find that most scholarly people would tell you that in a dissertation, by and large, for the most part, chapters one through three will not have personal pronouns. You don't use words like I, me, and mine, okay, and there, and he, and she. You don't refer to authors of literature as he or him or his, you know, it's, you, you, you talk in like third person, okay, you don't use personal pronouns. Now, it is true that when you get to chapters four and five, sometimes it's appropriate if you're doing qualitative research where you're, um, you know, interviewing people and in sometimes it is appropriate because um, the interviewer is uh, actually considered an instrument of the um, 
of, of that style, of that method, that it is appropriate sometimes to use personal pronouns there. Also, um, in Chapter 5 of a dissertation, there are reflection uh, portions of that chapter, and sometimes it is appropriate to use personal pronouns there. Um, but with that being said, uh, you know, chapters one through three and most of scholarly writing, you're not going to use personal pronouns. Um, so some of the writing assignments that we've had so far um, in the courses I've been teaching, sometimes there are reflection portions of the assignment. And so it's okay to use personal pronouns there. But I really like to get students to um, get away from that, if at all possible, because I just want them to train themselves to get away from those personal pronouns. Uh, scholarly writing, there shouldn't be any contractions. Just spell out the words that um, you mean. Next bulleted item, um, don't use generic time words like recently, currently, not long ago. Be specific. Say, in the 20th century, two theorists, blah, 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 blah. Um, in the 21st century, blah, blah, blah. Or even say, in the years, such and such, you know, and specifically state what those years were. So don't use uh, generic time words. Um, and then always use, as much as possible, um, the right verb tense. So most of the time, you're going to be using past tense when you're doing literature reviews because everybody you're reporting on has conducted their research in the past. So you use past tense verbs. Uh, once in a while, like when you're doing your research proposal, uh, you'll use future tense. But even then, after you can actually conduct your study and um, are done with it, um, then you have to convert everything to past tense because you've already um, collected your data. So um, just really be careful on your verb tenses. All right, so moving on. In scholarly writing, also for excellence, you're going to be using um, APA format for citations and references. Um, and also, you're going to be using something called the meal plan. Uh, within my access classes that I teach, I always put the meal plan, and many of the other professors do as well. And so we're going to be talking about the meal plan. The meal plan was. Um, not uh, was not um, created or, or authored by me or anyone from the University of Phoenix. It actually comes from Duke University. And within the classroom, you will see two documents um, in the main course content uh, page. Um, I have the meal plan as a document, and then I have Dr. Williams's uh, notes on the meal plan. And so we'll be talking about that uh, a lot within the next few weeks. And I'm just giving you an overview today. So with the meal plan, in a scholarly paragraph, you need to have a main idea sentence. And every paragraph should have one main idea. Hmm. Does that sound pretty familiar to you? <laughs> it should, because when we were talking about power writing, remember I said for expository paragraphs, every paragraph should have a main idea sentence. And notice how it's red. So for color coding purposes, I used the same color coding. You're going to see an extreme similarity between the power writing and the meal plan. I'm not going to read to you everything that's on each screen. I mainly just put it there for you so that you can read it later. Another part of the meal plan is that you need evidence. So your main idea needs support. Hmm. Again, does that sound kind of familiar to you? Well, it is familiar because really these evidence sentences, that's really your power to ideas, isn't it? So the main support sentences that I talked about in expository writing, those are your evidence or example sentences that we use in scholarly writing. Usually, probably all the time, <laughs> um, 
the evidence sentences, you're going to have a citation associated with it, okay? Because the evidence has to be from some scholarly source. So definitely are going to use an APA um, citation to go along with the evidence sentences, which really were your power two ideas when we were talking about expository writing. All right, in the meal plan, the A in meal stands for analysis. And you notice that it's in green. So the analysis sentences are similar um, in the power writing um, examples to uh, the power three ideas, okay? So your analysis sentence in a scholarly paragraph, um, these are your interpretation of the evidence or examples that you talked about in the sentence that was above it. So it's how you break uh, apart these ideas that you had gotten from the evidence. Uh, often you compare and contrast ideas from the evidence sentence that was above it. So in the scholarly writing, um, you know, the evidence and analysis, that's very much like in the power writing, um, our power two and power three ideas. Always follow a quote with your, your analysis of the quote. If you let a quote stand on its own, then the author of that quote will have a stronger voice in your paragraph. Maybe even your paper, then you will, and you don't want that to happen. You are the scholar, <laughs> okay? You are the scholar, you are the author, and you are only using other authors to support your ideas, but you're the one who's actually creating some new knowledge here, which is kind of exciting. All right, and then plan the last sentence of the paragraph is called a link sentence. Hmm, does that sound familiar too? Sure, just like in power writing where we talked about an ending sentence like a bow tying everything together, um, in the meal plan, the link sentence ties everything together. Creating links will help your reader understand the logic and organization of your paper. Okay, so we've talked about scholarly writing, and I'm going to give you a little taste for what's going to happen in our next session. Uh, we're going to be talking more about really what the meal plan is and what the meal plan is not, and talk more about how uh, the meal plan compares to expository writing, and we'll be talking about correct use of APA. I don't know how many more sessions, probably um, at least two more sessions that we will have in order to uh, build upon what we've talked about so far. So this was lecture number three. Um, I'm hoping that this is helping you face your journey with competent writing skills. I have uh, placed references there to, to make sure everyone realizes that um, Dr. Williams is not giving credit to herself for all of this information. <laughs> uh, the meal plan comes from Duke University and Power Writing. Uh, was a text written by J.E. Sparks. I hope that you've enjoyed this session, and I hope that you'll join us for session number four.